Hello, welcome to Ask the Expert, an award-winning daily series from 8.30 a.m. to 9 a.m. to help small businesses. If you have any questions, ask them in the comments of the live feed. If you need any more advice, join the official Intuit QuickBooks SMB community group on Facebook. Accountants and business experts are on hand 24-7. During the live session, we will be running a poll, so please do engage with it, and I'll reveal the result at the end. The Bank of England's Monetary Policy Committee, of which I am a member, sets monetary policy to aim for 2% inflation in a way that supports output and jobs. For this call, I'm going to discuss recent developments in the economy and monetary policy. At the end of 2019, before the pandemic, the economy was roughly in balance with inflation close to the 2% target and unemployment just below 4%, the lowest for over 40 years. When the pandemic hit, activity fell sharply early last year during the first lockdown. There's a partial recovery during the summer of last year and renewed weakness with the second and third lockdowns last winter. In Q1 of this year, January to March, the overall level of GDP, which is a broad measure of economic activity, was about 9% below the level of Q4 2019, a far greater de decline than in recessions of recent decades. Inflation fell last year and was close to zero in Q1 of this year, well below our 2% target. In response to that weakness in activity and undershoot in inflation, the economy has been underpinned by large support from fiscal and monetary policies. On fiscal policy, notable measures have included the furlough scheme and bounce back loans. On monetary policy, the MPC has cut bank rate to a record low of 0.1%, provided cheap funding to banks through the term funding scheme, and undertaken large amounts of asset purchases aimed at lowering long term borrowing costs and keeping them low. This policy, support, this policy support could not, of course, prevent the economy from shrinking during lockdowns. It is aimed to limit long-term damage to the economy by keeping people in work and keeping firms in business. And contrary to initial fears, unemployment in the UK has not soared. The unemployment rate rose close to 5% early this year, but it's since fallen a little and it remains well below levels seen after the recession of 2008-09. Moreover, while many firms have faced difficulties, we have not seen so far a massive wave of business failures. By keeping interest rates low, monetary policy has also aimed to ensure the economy is well placed to recover as the vaccination program allows restrictions to ease and encourages people and firms to spend again. Indeed, the economic recovery over the last couple of quarters has been a bit faster than we expected early this year. Consumer confidence has returned to normal levels and bank lending spreads, which widened sharply amidst heightened risk aversion early last year as the pandemic hit, have fallen back and are similar to our pre-COVID forecasts. In June, which is the latest official data, economic activity was still about 3.5% below the level of Q4 2019, a much smaller gap than earlier, but still a sizable shortfall. With further growth in the economy since then, the level of GDP now in September is probably fairly close to pre-pandemic levels, but the recovery has been very uneven. Consumer spending on goods has been buoyant, especially household durables, furniture and furnishings, Clothing sales have been weak and spending on services remains below its pre-pandemic level. Business investment in buildings is down markedly, while investment in IT and plant and machinery, as well as house building, have risen strongly. There has been a similar rotation of demand elsewhere, and the strength of spending on goods has produced a rapid recovery in world trade and global manufacturing output. With a further shift to internet sales, small retailers in general have done better than large retailers. The recovery has also been uneven in geographic terms. London has lagged, especially central London, with more spending linked to working from home. At the same time, the pandemic and Brexit 
have also impacted the economy's supply side, its potential output. With some weakness in investment last year, capital stock growth slowed. Moreover, workforce participation has fallen, especially among the under 25s and over 50s, and there's been a sizable outflow of foreign workers. This has reduced labor supply, especially in agriculture, some parts of manufacturing, construction, transport, restaurants, and hotels. With this rotation in demand and supply side changes, capacity pressures and shortages have recently emerged in some sectors, even before the economy as a whole regained its pre-pandemic level. Indeed, inflation has risen faster than expected over the last couple of quarters and was in line with the 2% target in July. Stronger global growth has lifted oil prices and hence fuel prices. Strong global spending on goods, with supply chains still impacted by the pandemic, has lifted global prices for commodities and manufactured goods. This has started to lift UK inflation, especially for consumer durables. Moreover, the recovery in services activity has led to some pickup in services inflation. In the MPC's latest assessment, which was published in early August, about a month ago, our central forecast then was that the economy would recover further in the second half of this year and thereafter. Unemployment would be little change near term as the end of the furlough is balanced by strong demand for labor and then, then the jobless rates would fall further next year. Inflation was forecast to rise further to about 4% late this year, but then returns for around the 2% target two and three years ahead as the effects from recent increases in oil and goods prices fade. My own view at the AUKUS meeting was that with the recovery in the economy and inflation back to target, we no longer need as much monetary stimulus as previously. My view is that with the current policy stance, we probably face a persistent inflation overshoot versus the 2% target. And this reflects risks of more persistent pressure from global costs, plus greater domestic cost and capacity pressures with a faster drop in unemployment over coming quarters. I also worry that continuing with asset purchases when CPI inflation is 4% and the output gap is closed, that's the likely situation later this year, might well cause medium term inflation expectations to drift higher. Such an outcome could require a more substantial tightening of monetary policy later and might limit the committee's scope to respond promptly the next time the economy needs more stimulus. Hence, at the August meeting, I voted to end the current asset purchase program. That would still leave in place a very supportive monetary policy stance and hence probably not derail the welcome recovery in the economy. It would be more akin to easing off the accelerator than applying the brakes. The majority on the MPC voted to continue with the asset purchase program, and so that is what happened. I'm not going to announce now how, how I will vote at our next meeting later in September. That decision will, of course, be made at the appropriate time and there'll be plenty of data and analysis before then. Beyond the next few meetings, I want to stress that if bank rates, our key interest rate, does rise in the next year or so, it's likely that any rise would be relatively limited. The neutral level of rates has fallen significantly over the last 20 years. And it's not clear that we would even need to get close to, to neutral in the next year. Of course, if, and this is not my central expectation, the economy develops in such a way that further easing is required in the next year or two, the MPC has the scope and tools to do so. Either way, the committee will remain focused on fulfilling our remit which is to return inflation to the 2% target on a sustained basis in a way that supports output and jobs. Ultimately, the framework of an independent central bank with a clear remit and effective policy tools is why the UK will not face a persistent inflation problem. So I think we've got some questions which are coming through. Uh, let's just see if I can pick some of those up. Uh, first question from Sophie 
on uh, Instagram. Uh, when do you think the output of the economy will increase or return to levels like before the pandemic? Or do I think it will be different? I, I think the overall level of output in the economy is probably back to pre-pandemic levels, that is Q4 2019 this month or perhaps next month, so around now. But I do want to stress that it is a very uneven pattern. Some sectors are already operating above pre-pandemic levels, even while some other sectors are still well below. Employment in some regions is already above pre-pandemic levels, whereas in others, notably central London, it's markedly lower than it was. So an overall return to pre-pandemic levels masks quite a lot of variation. Capacity pressures in some sectors, still actually quite tough conditions in plenty of others. Craig on uh, Facebook Messenger. What plans are the Bank of England putting in place over the next five years to help small businesses? One of the big things um, that you've seen during the pandemic has been support specifically tailored to try to, un to underpin the availability of credit to small firms. Look, if you think back to the 2008 to 09 recession, what you saw then was as the banks uh, got into difficulties, there's a big deterioration in credit availability, especially for small firms. And that exacerbated the downturn, it made things worse. And so many small firms then faced difficulties, even when the economy itself was beginning to recover. The term funding scheme, which I mentioned in my talk, which has provided cheap funding to banks, is specifically geared to encouraging banks to ensure that they lend to small firms. The government also has done measures, for example, the bounce back loan scheme which aimed at providing long-term, relatively low-cost funding for small firms. I do think, you know, this is one of the, um, if you like, the lessons that came out of the last recession was the need to limit scarring on the economy, to limit long-term damage. Nothing, we, you, not, nothing that policy could do could prevent the economy from suffering during the lockdowns, but the aim is to limit the extent of long-term damage so that as restrictions ease, the economy can recover as quickly as possible. Um, next question from RB on YouTube. Do I think the Bank of England should reduce the stock of asset purchases? And when should the Bank of England raise rates? So at the August meeting, I voted to reduce the target stock of asset purchases. In other words, to curtail the current asset purchase program. Um, so that the asset purchase program would have stopped then rather than continue in line with the current guidance through until the end of the year. That wouldn't actually reduce the stock of assets which has already been purchased. It would just imply that we would stop with any further asset purchases. Now, what we've said is that um, we won't reduce the stock of assets which we have already purchased unless and until bank rate reaches a level of 0.5%. So our first tool, if you like, um, would be to raise interest rates before we actually reduce the stock of assets that we have purchased. As to when I think interest rates might rise, that would depend on the economic outlook. Um, if the economy continues to recover and inflation shows signs of being more persistent, then it might be right to think of interest rates going up in the next year or so but that's not a promise and it depends on economic conditions. And as I said in my talk, any rise in interest rates in the next year or so should be relatively limited given that a neutral level of interest rates is much lower than it used to be. And it's not clear that we would even need to get back to neutral in that period. Uh, Diana on Instagram Messenger. As an owner of a small business, how can I get my voice heard when decisions are being made that will impact me and my business, such as interest rates. So the Bank of England has regional agents around the UK, and this is an important thing, and I want, want to mention it. There are 12 agents, one in each of the regions and devolved nations 
of the UK, and each of them is supported by a team in region. They are in constant contact with a range of businesses, large, medium, small, micro businesses. So if you're not talking to the Bank of England agent in your region, contact the Bank of England, our head office number you can find on the website, and the agents will be, in, I will, we will try to make sure that the agents get in touch with you because we like to hear from firms. It's very useful for us to hear from businesses on the ground, what's happening to demand, what are your hiring intentions, what's happening to your investment plans. That gives us a much richer and more detailed picture of the economy and informs our decision-making. So please do get in contact with your regional agents. Antonia on Facebook Messenger. I run a bakery and employ three others. During the lockdown, we took a hit but shifted to deliveries and that helped. As a small business owner, I hear a lot about the bank setting interest rates and monetary policy, but I don't fully understand how it affects me. Uh, can you explain? Excuse me. <clears throat> so the, the, the main tools of monetary policy are bank rates, which is our policy rate and asset purchases. And in general, when we loosen policy, that is cutting interest rates or expanding the target stock of asset purchases, then borrowing costs for households and businesses fall. That encourages people to spend, businesses to hire, businesses to invest, demand in the economy strengthens, unemployment falls, and inflation, which would have been too low, eventually gets pulled up by stronger growth and capacity pressures. The opposite way, the opposite way around, if the economy is overheating, higher interest rates, cool demand. So monetary policy is a very powerful tool to affect demand in the aggregate economy. What it can't do is to favor one sector over a different one. It supports the overall economy rather than just this firm or just that firm. Um, question now coming through from uh, Angelique on Twitter DM. What do I think has been the biggest shock to the UK economy, Brexit or the pandemic, and which will have the most long lasting effects? Very interesting question, this one. Um, the short run effects of the pandemic have clearly been much greater than the short run effects of Brexit. Um, what we saw last year was um, in the spring of last year when we had the first lockdown, the level of GDP, the, le the level of economic activity in the UK fell by more than 20%. And that was by far the biggest drop in GDP that we've seen in recent decades, far greater than seen in any recession of the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, or the 2000s. So the pandemic has been a tremendous adverse shock to act activity on, on a very large scale, and it's not over yet. But in terms of the long-term effects, I suspect that the long-term effects on the level of activity of the, of the pandemic, provided things develop you know, in line with current expectations, vaccines spreading across the population, vaccines are effective, the long-term effects on activity of the pandemic I think are likely to be relatively small. Investment after an initial dip last year has recovered, so capital stock growth suffered a bit, but not that much. There's been a drop in participation, especially among the under 25s and the over 50s. So there's probably some adverse effects on activity long run, but much smaller than the initial hit. And policy has aimed to bridge the economy through that initial period of weakness to limit long-term scarring and long-term damage so that as we recover from the pandemic, we can recover as fully as possible. The temporary, the initial effects of Brexit, well, we've seen some of them. Um, the long-term effects in terms of slower capital stock growth um, and a bit less workforce um, may well be bigger than the long-term effects of the pandemic. Uh, Graham on Facebook Messenger, when do I think that inflation will level out? So on our current forecast, 
which depends on the current level of commodity prices and exchange rates. The peak in inflation is perhaps Q4 of this year, perhaps Q1 of next year, at around 4%. But obviously that forecast is highly conditional on the future developments in commodity prices, other costs, exchange rates, and so forth. So uh, that's where we are at the moment. We do publish off, um, updated forecasts regularly. The last one was early August. The next one will be a couple of months from now. Um, I do want to stress, though, that quite a lot of the factors which are pushing inflation higher in the next couple of quarters, from where we've been on target in July to a likely peak of around 4%, quite a lot of those factors are transitory. In other words, they will push inflation up this year, early next year, but they won't, in keep, they won't keep inflation at 4% two years out and three years out. Examples of transitory factors are the uh, rebound in oil prices globally, which fell sharply early last year as global growth weakened and have rebounded this year as global growth strengthened. That gives you a one-off rise in inflation, but unless oil prices go on rising sharply, you don't get a recurring effect from that source in subsequent years. In setting monetary policy, our focus is much more on the outlook for inflation two to three years ahead, when factors that are clearly transitory have faded. So we're guided much more by persistent effects, for example, from cost and capacity pressures in the UK. Uh, next question from Christian on YouTube. Were any other M uh, MPC members close to voting for asset purchase reduction? You know, I can't speak for other members. Um, so my vote was to reduce the target stock of asset purchases. Um, as you know, the uh, the overall vote um, was uh, seven to one. So I was in a minority of one. The other seven members voted to continue with the current asset purchase program. But it's not for me to say whether other members were close or not. Our next uh, decision meeting, as you know, is in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, Grace on IG Messenger. I own a small business on Etsy and the shift in a percent here and there in interest rates doesn't really seem to affect me. Why is this? Is this only really relevant for big corporations and investment bankers? I would say no. Um, I don't know about your individual business um, and the factors which uh, affect that. But when you're thinking about the effects of interest rates on the prospects of your business, like if you've got a loan, there might be an effect on your own cash flow. But for many businesses, the far more important impact is the broader effects of changes in interest rates, monetary policy on demand in the economy as a whole. When monetary policy is eased, demand tends to strengthen. And so even if you yourself as a, as a small business have no debt, the chances are that demand will be stronger. Um, and then you get knock-on effects from that. As demand is stronger, people hire more, people invest more, that encourages further spending. So you may see that as quite a, an indirect link from monetary policy to the prospects for individual businesses. But all the experience of recent decades is that those effects are powerful. Monetary policy has provided considerable support to the economy through the pandemic, as has fiscal policy. I think that's been completely appropriate. As if, provided the economy continues to recover, it may become appropriate to withdraw some of that support in order to ensure that we keep inflation at the 2% target. Dominic on, <clears throat> Dominic on Twitter DM. A lot of my employees in the past have asked for pay rises because the cost of living is increasing due to inflation. What should we do if our business can't afford these pay rises? How do I manage these conversations? I can't tell you how to do all of your internal management. Um, I would stress that a lot of the rise in inflation above target later this year 
is transitory, temporary, a one-off, not factors that are likely to persist. And so if those, if that rise in inflation were to be fully reflected in pay growth, then that would be adding costs to businesses and potential future inflation pressures for the economy. So I would stress really the transitory nature of any rise in, in of any rise in inflation from later this year. One of the things that we are seeing um, through the pandemic is quite strong investment in measures aimed at underpinning supporting productivity, quite strong investment in technology. And that may be one of the lasting effects of the pandemic. And that has the possibility of producing stronger productivity growth down the road. Simon on Facebook Messenger. I took out a loan earlier this year to help cover business, biz, uh, basic business costs. Is this loan going to be taxable at the end of the financial year? Talk to a financial advisor. So I, I'm just not the guy to give you advice on that. So we set monetary policy. Uh, the Bank of England does not set fiscal policy. The government does that. Um, so I think that you probably need to talk to someone who can give you tax advice. Uh, Tilly on Instagram DM. Can I simplify exactly what inflation is and, what's effect and what affects it? I've noticed it's being spoken about a lot on the news recently, but I don't really understand it. So inflation is the rate of increase in the price of goods and services. So let's uh, simplify. Let, let's say there are only two things that people buy. They buy bread and they buy cars and they spend half the money on bread and they spend half the money on cars. If the price of bread goes up by 1% and the price of cars goes up by 3%, then the overall inflation rate is an average of the two. It would be 2%. Right, so it's the overall inflation rate across a range of items. Our target is to keep inflation at 2% in a way that supports output and jobs. Obviously, there are short-term factors that will push inflation temporarily above or below target, and we can't fully offset those from month to month. But 2% inflation is where we're aiming for. Uh, the poll results are in. We asked you, are you confident about your business recovery over the next six months? 40% of you said yes, and 60% answered no. Very interesting. We get a lot of um, information about the, the economy. I mentioned the bank's agents. There's also a range of business surveys, which we pay close attention to. And so thank you for responding to that. That will feed into our decision making and gives us very useful insights on what's happening in the economy now. So um, I think our time is coming to a close. Thank you all for tuning in this morning. Um, if you want to get in contact, um, I would encourage you to uh, please contact our regional agents, who, as I said, are in close contact with many firms throughout the UK. Uh, coming up on Ask the Experts tomorrow, is multi-brand franchiser and special advisor, Sean Goldsmith. Tune in to get advice on strategic planning, building a franchise and going global. A reminder that if you, that if you need any more advice, join the official Intuit QuickBooks SMB community group on Facebook and accountants and business experts are on hand 24 seven. Thanks very much. I really enjoyed answering your questions this morning. Thank you.